your holy and precious word. We ask that you would give it power through the words that I speak. Come, Lord. We gather to learn of you and to experience your presence. We want you to speak to us today, God, to each one of us, deep in our hearts. Come and open your word to us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Looks like I'm struggling with throat today. Don't worry about me and don't, you know, don't wince because you think I'm in pain. I'm not in pain. It doesn't hurt. I just have a hard time talking which is not good for a preacher. Well, uh, this is the seventh day of Easter, seventh Sunday of Easter, and it's also Ascension Sunday where we celebrate the Ascension of our Lord. So read with me first uh, Luke chapter 24, uh, beginning at verse 46. Then I'll move to Genesis, I mean uh, to Acts chapter 1, 1 through 9. He, that is Jesus, told them, this is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what the Father has promised, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. When he led them out of the vicinity of Bethlehem, he lift, uh, Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. Acts chapter one. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote you about all the things Jesus began to do until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know times or dates the Father set up on his, by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Amen. The resurrection occurred on the first day of the festival of first fruits. Pentecost was held on the on 50 days after that day. Verse 3 tells us that Jesus spent 40 days with the apostles before he ascended into heaven. That leaves 10 days. Ten days until Pentecost. He said, just a few days, you're going to receive what the Father promised. They had ten days to wait. Now we have only a few verses <laughs> about those ten days and what happened then. We know he, he, they spent considerable time together in prayer. We know at one time they elected Matthias to take Judas's place as the 12th apostle. That's about it. We can only imagine what went on in their minds when they were alone with their own thoughts. Surely, they experienced eager anticipation of the promises that Jesus had made to them. 
some incredible promises. Just as surely. That eagerness was mixed with anxiety over some other things Jesus had told them. Things like Matthew 16, 24. If anyone comes after me, he must take up his cross daily and deny himself and follow me. Or John 15, 20, where he said, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Matthew 24, 9. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations. That's just to mention a few. I mean, if the bishop had said those things to me just prior to my ordination, uh, there would have been serious temptation just to go back to my law practice. I mean, who wants to hear that stuff? During those 10 days, surely there were dark nights when they thought, what have I gotten myself into? What is going to happen? Early on in my ministry, I I read works, and still do, of several preachers from the Pentecostal traditions of Christianity. And they wrote about the fact that many people seeking for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that Jesus' promise is going to happen next Sunday. It's Pentecost Sunday. And uh, uh, they would experience what the writers called the dark night of the soul. And that's the title of my message today, The Dark Night of the Soul. And actually, even that's something (laughs) of a misnomer because actually it went more than a night. Sometimes it went several days, a week. I think it may have been a a similar thing going on with the apostles uh, in those 10 days. Where, where they were waiting for the promise, baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now those writers uh, described a struggle deep in the soul. Several of them compared it to the story of Jacob. You remember when Jacob wrestled with God? He was coming back after being off at, with Laban. He had two wives, a family, and he had great herds. And now he's going back to his hometown and he don't know what his brother Esau going to do. When, when he left, Esau was mad. And he figured he's still mad. And he's concerned. He left everybody on one side of the brook. He went on the other side and he was alone. And it says uh, he wrestled with a man till daybreak. All night long he struggled. And when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the hip, the socket of Jacob's hip. So that his hip was wrenched and he, as he wrestled with the man. The man said, let me go. It's almost daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go until you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. He said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but now it's Israel. Because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying it is because I saw God face to face and my life was spared. I had a hard time making that association because when I read the New Testament, I understand that spirit baptism is something that God wants. Matter of fact, there's nothing he wants more than his church to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and power. I mean, it's not something we have to wrestle out of God's hands. It's not something we have to snatch away from God. He wants to give it to us. But yet again, I knew those struggles were real. 
You, you, don't, you don't make that stuff up and write it in a book. You can tell when it's real. It took me a lot of reading to understand why it was such a struggle. The struggle is not getting something from God, but giving up one's self to God. We don't want to give up ourselves. I know I didn't, don't. Well, I mean, we're, we're, we're taught to live under the control of your mind. And you know what you do? Not to just have God tell you to do something and you do it. I know the man that led me to the Lord, Jim Kilgo, we used to talk about it a long time, right? whether or not you got to give up your will to God. And he didn't think you did. But later on, he changed his mind. Remember with me again the Lord to, the words of our Lord Jesus in Luke 14, 33. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything cannot be my disciple. Our Luke 14, 26, this is in the message translation. Anyone who comes to me but refuses to let go of father, mother, spouse, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even one's self cannot be my disciple. You know, even Jesus had something of a dark night of the soul, didn't he? In the Garden of Gethsemane. It says in Matthew 20, it says, going a little further, he fell on his face to the ground and prayed, Oh, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. Yes, Jesus had to give up his human capacity, his human will to the will of God. And therein, I believe, lies the crux of this dark night of the soul. The, the struggle to give up oneself and one's will to God. Now surely in those days leading up to Pentecost, they struggled with the idea of surrendering everything to Jesus. Just as surely we struggle with it too, don't we? If we're honest, it's a continual struggle. After I recommitted my life to Jesus, August the 29th, 1980, for a year, I did nothing with regard to my spiritual life but read my Bible, pray, attend Sunday school and church, which is mostly probably what everybody does. Well, it was fun and it was exciting. and I, I felt new life. I was overcoming some terrible depression and difficult time I'd had for two years. Well, then I began to wonder, is this all there is to being a Christian? <laughs> I, I was, what, what, what am I supposed to do with my life? I'm just not supposed to just live it and go to church. I, just, I need to be doing something. Well, I was with a group from St. James Church at Cove Crest Christian Renewal Center. And a camp meeting that summer. I, I'm thinking it was 1981. I'm not 100% sure of that. Could have been 82. But Dr. Mark Rutland was preaching uh, that camp meeting. I don't remember much of the sermon because he kind of got me a hook in my jaw early on and God was dealing with me. And uh, what, what I was hearing God say was, Jerry, you're saved, man. You're going to heaven. You got that. <laughs> but you're still calling the shots. I'm your Savior, but I am not your Lord. As Mark gave the altar call for spirit baptism, he pulled his keys out of his pocket. And he asked us to do the same. So get your keys out. You got the key to your car, key to the office, keys to the house, keys to the other car. You know what he mentioned? Well, keys to the boat house and to the boat. Keys to the lake house or the beach house. 
He said, if you're going to walk in the fullness of God's power, you've got to give God all the keys, every single one of them. Well, as Mark gave the, uh, he called us to the altar. I got out running in there and threw my keys on the altar. I said, he can, he can have them all. You know, it's true. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Lord means over everything. When Mark prayed for me, the meanest prayer I ever heard prayed over a man before. I, I don't believe I ever asked him to pray for me again. He said, Father, you heard what the man said. He's given everything to you, and I pray now you'd hold him to it. And I don't care what you have to do. You have to take everything away from him. Do it, Lord, but hold him to it. Then he reached over and put his hand on my head and said, Brother, receive thou the Holy Spirit. I didn't speak in tongues that night. But when I left that altar, I knew something was different. I knew that I had set myself on a course from which I could never retreat. I continued practicing spiritual disciplines. <laughs> pondering what I should do with my life. I remember saying to God several times, Lord, I'll do whatever you want, but I don't want to go to Africa or someplace like that to be a missionary. I don't want to do that. <laughs> I had given Jesus all the keys to my stuff, but I hadn't given him the key to me. You know, but God uses what we give him. He works with us. He's patient. You know, I'd been doing nothing for a year, but I'm telling you, within, within a month, after that Cove Crest meeting, uh, I was asked to give my testimony uh, at Laity Sunday. You know, we do that in the Methodist Church, used to. I don't think too many people do it now, but we have a lay speaker on Laity Sunday, and I was going to give the message. And I... There were three of us that were supposed to speak. I'll never forget that. And they told me I only had seven minutes. And, man, I couldn't get it down. I couldn't get it under 20. <laughs> I know what I was going to do. And finally, the week before that Sunday, the other two guys dropped out. <laughs> so I had the whole time. I was like, <laughs> Then I was asked to chair the evangelism committee at the church and teach the high school Sunday school class. So God was putting me to work. A number of us had started attending full gospel businessmen's events. And I was at a full gospel meeting in Rock Eagle. There were about 400 people there. And they, they call on people to give testimony. And don't give me any warning or anything. At least that's what they said. I said, surely they give warning. But they don't. <laughs> they called my name. And uh, my friend Harold Lund is sitting right next to him. And he said, I almost fainted. <laughs> and I was just sitting next to you. <laughs> I, don't have, I still to this day don't know what I said. But it must have been all right. Because after that, I started getting invited to give my testimony at Full Gospel Benjamin's meeting all over Georgia. And I even went to South Carolina a couple of times and Kentucky once. And all that was making me very uncomfortable because those Full Gospel folks were big and speaking in tongues and I didn't do it. And we'd go back in there to pray and they'd all be praying in the Spirit. And I, I complained to God. I said, God, I'm embarrassed. You're going to send me off these places. You need to... You need to give me that gift. <clears throat> well, it wasn't long after that I went to a Methodist men's retreat at Rock Eagle. Dr. Jimmy Buskirk was preaching, and he was a famous preacher and pastor, evangelist, seminary professor. And I was so excited just to be in the same building with him. He spoke on Saturday night, and uh, 
uh, our men's group from, that had gone down together from St. James were ushers that day. So we, so we were sitting on the front row. And uh, when the altar call was given, I, I was under conviction. And uh, I had this overwhelming urge to just get on my knees, but I'm sitting down front and all those people back there looking at me, you know. So I just kind of scrunched down how you do and ease down in the seat. Turned around and got on my knees. I had my face in the chair in the seat. And I just decided I'd just peek and see if anybody was watching. I couldn't see anything. It looked like the room was empty. God was moving and the whole place were on the, they were on their knees on the floor. Dr. Buskirk was calling people to come to the altar to get saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. And he'd talk to them a while, then he'd drop the phone and he would pray in the Spirit, praying in tongues. And I could hear him. I think the mic was picking it up too. I don't think he knew that. That was a Methodist meeting now, wasn't it? Uh, I heard myself say, okay, God, I'll go to Africa or anywhere else you want me to go on a dead burn planet. I'm tired of this. <laughs> Immediately, I could feel something in my body. It was electric. So I just began to pray and worship God. And after a while, I felt a hand on my shoulder. And it was hot, not, not unpleasantly hot, but it was hot. And I could just feel that heat rush through my body. I was just lost in prayer when I heard a voice say, can I pray with you about something? And it sort of, you know, when he spoke to me, I sort of came to myself and I realized I was praying in a language that I did not know. And I thought and thought about that. I said, you know, I know I was baptized in the Holy Spirit at Cove Crest, but you know what it was? God wanted to wait to that Methodist meeting. <laughs> so the next time I went to full gospel, they called me up on the stage to give a testimony again. And I walked up there and I said, and I told them that story. I said, it happened right here in this auditorium, but it wasn't at a full gospel meeting. It was a Methodist men's meeting. And God just wanted me to tell you this to make sure you understand that you Pentecostals don't have locks on the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Everybody laughed and we enjoyed it. But that night, you see, I surrendered everything. I had given God all my stuff, but I hadn't given Him me. I hadn't given Him my will, and it was my will that controlled my tongue. You get it? You got to give it all to Jesus. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. The, the issue in justification or receiving salvation is forgiveness of sin, and that's it. Nothing else is required. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust him, and you shall be saved. You are saved. But the issue and spirit baptism and walking in the fullness of God's power is the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, I think God intends for those things to happen close to one another, but because of how we've preached, we, we don't, that hasn't happened. Sometimes it's separated by years, as it was with me. I just don't think God is going to endure us with power until we are totally surrendered to Jesus and He's Lord of our lives. That's just it. Now that night began a chain of events that has brought me to this time and this place. I am now 77 years old. I have five maybe eight or more so years that I'll be able to do this job if my voice holds up that long. I don't want to spend those years preaching to a dying church. Nor do I want you to spend those years listening to a has-been preacher whose best years are behind me. I want this coming week 
between Ascension Sunday and Pentecost Sunday to be our dark night of the soul. And let us struggle to give up our stuff and give up ourselves and surrender our will to God as we expectantly look forward to the day of Pentecost and the empowerment of the Spirit to be the people of God, to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And let us get active in witnessing to our neighbors and inviting them to church and filling up all these pews, you know. Dr. Fauci says we can take these strips off of here and take off the mask and we can go back to doing normal stuff if we've been fully vaccinated. So maybe we ought to get some vaccines and hold them at the door there. I want to see the church grow. I want to see me grow. I want to see the power of God moving among God's people. And I believe that have preached with all my heart and might that will happen when we are surrendered to Jesus, our stuff and ourselves. And he's truly the Lord of our lives in this church. Now the text for next Sunday, Pentecost Sunday, is Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Acts chapter 2, 1 through 11. And I'm asking all of us to read it every day and pray that what happened that day in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago will happen here next Sunday. Let this next week be our dark night of the soul and let us be struggling with ourselves to give up ourselves to God so he can fill us, equip us, and empower us to be his people in the world. Let's pray.